Welcome back. I hope you all had a chance to enjoy the snacks and drinks provided. Let's move on to our next panel discussion, which is called Internalizing ESG Risk. This will be kindly moderated by Mr. Vikram Kumar from International Finance Corporation. We will also conduct a Q&A section after the discussion. May I please invite our moderator and our three esteemed panelists up on stage, Mr. Peter Chen, Head of Official Institutional Coverage, BNP Paribas, Ms. Sneha sang -Vi, Head of Financial Markets Asia, Westpac Bank. And last but not least, Mr. Augusto Hidalgo, Head of Capital Science and Policy Practice, Willis Towers Watson. Please welcome onto the stage. Morning, morning all of you and thank you for taking out the time to join this discussion. Uh, I have the honor of representing a very, very uh, qualified and expert panel on the subject of uh, ESG internalization, uh, something that uh, we as IFC uh, keep very close to our heart. Uh, I think one of the challenges uh, which was discussed in the last panel uh, <coughs> extensively was how do financial institutions internalize ESG risks? How do they understand them? How do they quantify them? And how do they adapt their existing lending processes, uh, operational uh, decision making to incorporate these ESG risks? As IFC, uh, you know, we learned this the hard way almost two, two decades back in the late 1990s when we were involved in a large amount of infrastructure lending, and we still are. Uh, and I think one of the things that we uh, recognized that there was a clear difference in the performance. I think this goes to some of the questions that were asked uh, in the previous panel is how do you differentiate between a company that's actually high up on the ESG scale versus uh, one that's not? Our own portfolio actually gave up a number of 7% um, uh, uh, difference in performance on the equity side. When we look at the MSCI Emerging Market Index, we also did another study and we came out with a difference about 1.5%. So companies that have good ESG systems uh, actually perform much better than companies that don't. Uh, of course, you know, there may be other influencing factors, but this is what our data throws up. So from a risk perspective, there is a clear benefit to working with companies that actually perform really well on the ESG scale. Our own approach also went through a sort of catharsis, you know, and I think banks, a lot of banks today are, uh, are looking at ESG in terms of a compliance, uh, from a compliance perspective. Uh, we moved on from there and we said, how do we take it a level further, move from compliance to outcomes, outcomes. And that allows us to actually look at it more from a private sector perspective. Because when you work with a company today and you figure out that it is not there, in terms of uh, where you want it to be, how do you work with the company to get it where it needs to be? Uh, you know, what time frame, what are the objectives, what is the path towards uh, complying, eventual compliance and, and uh, adaptation of the performance standards? Clearly, uh, a decade, uh, 2006, when we actually came out with the performance standard, which my colleague from uh, Citibank uh, referred to, well, the world has moved on, and the equator principles, uh, 97 institutions across the world uh, from 37 countries have now taken on the equator principles, which have been based on the IFC performance standards. And I think the interesting point, which I was actually mentioning to some of my colleagues here earlier uh, before in the pre-panel <coughs> pre discussion, is that not much of emerging Asia is represented in these 97 institutions, which by the way, account for a vast majority of uh, the banking sector assets. So there's no Indonesian banks, there's no Singaporean banks, there's no Thai banks. And I think that's an opportunity. That's an opportunity for the financial sector in emerging Asia to integrate uh, better with, with the global economy. Uh, I'll move on to now the next phase of the discussion where I request each of the panelists to maybe shortly introduce themselves and then talk about four key areas. Again, uh, you know, I'm 
flexibility to choose what you would like to focus on. The first uh, area that I would hope you would cover is, you know, what is the driver for ESG? Uh, you know, what are the governing factors and capacity building initiatives that are required for integrating ESG into day-to-day -day business? So, you know, strategic direction, top-down, and, and the presence of sustainability units inside uh, your institutions. How do you implement ESG? You know, what is the data that you're supposed to track? How do you quantify the data? Uh, how do you model the data? Uh, and finally, uh, you know, how do you do stress testing with this data? And finally, uh, and most importantly, is how do you translate the ESG integration from your operation into the operations of your clients and then measure it over the lifetime of the project? So these are the areas that I would request uh, the panelists to, to to focus on, and I'd like to start with Augusta from Wills, Willis. Right, that works. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I uh, had an interesting exchange with Assistant Governor Wajdeep this morning, and asked her what's the difference between, in outcomes at least. Uh, between this year's forum and last. And uh, she informed me that uh, a call to action around ESG integration in banks, would be, that would be a great outcome for today's uh, Sustainable Banking Forum. Um, in line with that, um, I think one way to look at integration would be maybe from the consultant's point of view. So I'm from Willis Towers Watson. I uh, sell consulting to development banks, governments, and corporates around climate physical risk quantification. And what we do is we produce something called an annual aggregate loss figure. So it's a price, it's a number. And it has to do with where you sit today in terms of climate and disaster risk reflected um, in a, uh, a number. And maybe that's one way to understand how the baselining exercise from which your integration efforts around not only climate obviously, but ESG uh, would be driven off. Uh, it's perhaps a way to understand how one might be able to prioritize different initiatives in terms of how they contribute uh, to your resilience as, as a bank uh, or, or as a regulator. And that's maybe the uh, flavor that I'd like to uh, take away from this. So um, the typical um, loss model is uh, something that has been consumed by insurance companies and reinsurance companies for many decades now. And what this is, it's a hazard model, mathematical model, it's a vulnerability model, uh, which you damage, imagine Google Maps, and you damage that using a mathematical model. This provides us with an economic loss. From that 100% loss figure, um, insurers in the past have tended to drive their risk transfer decision making off some of this data, which is fairly well established, it's about two decades now since Hurricane Andrew. And now the banking community, in line with any number of pressures, whether it be uh, on the compliance side, whether that's NGFS, uh, physical risk on climate that uh, sits inside recommendation one of NGFS. Uh, if we're talking about the Bank of England, the Financial Stability Board, uh, there's uh, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure. And uh, the, again, the idea of what to disclose is a big question in the G20 companies. But increasingly, I was in front of the Bankers Association of the Philippines about four weeks ago, the G20 headquartered banks were uh, quite encouraging um, because head office had already told them that they were going to follow some TCFD criteria. The local banks were more cautious, as you would understand. You know, there are questions about G20, not G20, but I think one of the things that all banks and all regulators can agree is that 
when you talk about uh, shareholder activism, uh, as our friends from the first panel described, or, or customer displeasure, uh, the climate conversation, the ESG conversation, is kind of like that joke about, you know, can you outrun a bear? Well, you don't have to. You just have to run faster than your competitor. And so this is, for example, just a little bit of data about how many shareholder resolutions are being brought up in U.S. Uh, publicly listed companies, as many of your banks are publicly listed. Um, and there was a question in the crowd about the cost of uh, climate risk. Now, something I'm from the financial services industry. I used to run a publicly listed reinsurance company. And as we all know, cost of capital is very near and dear to all of our hearts. We want that number to be low. Climate says it's not going to be low. Climate action says that efficient practices, uh, wise selection of mortgage portfolios through good underwriting, which reflects uh, climate action, is probably going to reduce your institution's capital requirement, even though the entire industry is going to be hit up with a increased cost of capital. We all know this. Oh, in uh, the UN Climate Summit in October in New York, our CEO is going to announce a coalition of many asset managers. We have about eight trillion, I think, so it's um, all signed up, talking about climate resilient infrastructure investment. Because as we all know, there is no different, there's no difference in the asset valuations of a stock, a bond, which is more climate resilient than another today. But there are many, many serious questions about whether that will continue in future. Now, the idea is not to um, scare a lot of people. The idea is to show two sides of the coin of the climate reality, the ESG reality. And the fact of the matter is there are huge amounts of money to be made today in replacing inefficient and polluting technology with new and efficient, less polluting technology. You see, we all say that at the board level, my board as well, what drives the action is the regulation, the circular, the compliance aspect that causes board and executive decision making because we are practical people. But to engage our staff and our boards, they need to see the reality of this many trillion dollar business that we need information in order to evaluate. So is this purely a risk officer question? You know, let's look at the Bank of Thailand. Um, Suisa just told me just now that the responsibility for sustainability had moved from regulator to uh, strategy part of the Bank of Thailand. This is a good indication. You know, it is a strategic question. And, you know, too many diagrams, but uh, basically, for whatever criteria there are for your bank to be judged by its climate resilience or ESG compliance, you want to be the one on the outside, not the one on the inside, spider web. And so it's a strategic question. This is money that is waiting for you to be made, to make. This is, these are opportunities that your competitors may not be seeing. Now, uh, that young lady is famous. Her name is Greta. And she was at the World Economic Forum in Davos. Uh, but the, uh, at least for me, equally famous guy on the right side is my CEO. The point of which, uh, at World Economic Forum in Davos, at the World Ocean Summit uh, in Mexico last year, the, the commitment to put ESG climate at the top of the agenda as a strategic part of your board's agenda rests at the top level of your corporation. And so we try to live these things. And uh, this, is, this is my boss, Rowan Douglas. And so we need a top-driven 
uh, agenda. Of course, those top managers, that board member looking at strategy, uh, they need data. And the science at the moment, the Geneva Association is a think tank, generally thinks about insurance, uh, but think about it perhaps on the risk management side of insurance, the science that informs risk transfer. And the convergence is now all these disaster loss modelers, cyber modelers, people who tend to predict loss, are uh, beginning to add climate scenarios onto that. There's any number of uh, initiatives around the world around that. And it's easy to see that uh, it, there's going to be a demand for this in the future. Um, where we see the intersection uh, between physical risk and uh, your ESG situation in, in Thailand and in ASEAN is probably in item one, recommendation one of the NGF, the, the Network for Greening of Financial uh, NGFS. And we see very clearly that uh, climate is considered to be a financial stability agenda item. We see this from the very top. The Bank of Thailand has been a, a strong proponent of this agenda for a number of years. And I think it's appropriate after the publishing of this document that we make uh, create more awareness that the initiative must be driven at the top, that it is informed by good science, good information, and that there are resources from government uh, and outside uh, that make this possible for your institutions to accomplish. So, you know, this is an example of the kind of uh, study that one would do. So, again, take a hazard model, take, you damage a vulnerability model, you create an economic loss, and the applications for banks that we've seen, uh, I'll just name one or two. In the case of a large property owner, uh, huge exposures to climate, hydro, meteorological risk, and so on and so forth. Um, what we aim to do uh, over here is understand physical climate risk and what financial assets would be exposed. Um, and we produced a bunch of numbers an annual aggregate loss figure. Same thing with a Fortune 500 bank, had a big mortgage portfolio, I believe it was about 51,000 mortgages in the, in the United States. Uh, if you imagine a map of the United States, uh, you know, the tor tornadoes all tend to be around Oklahoma. Uh, Florida tends to have the, uh, the cyclone risk, and we produce numbers that inform uh, the uh, mortgage portfolio uh, team. Um, around lending decisions. Uh, same idea for an investment portfolio. Which ones of the investments are more or less uh, exposed to climate risk and uh, to what degree? All of which is to say that uh, in the area of climate finance, which at some point, 2014, was a certain number of billions of dollars, and which in 2014 we were all participating. Well, that number has just has multiplied many, many times. We're still all participating in climate finance, and your strategic directions around this, informed by uh, the numbers, the physical risk um, mitigation, is something worth considering for the years to come. I want to leave it at that and uh, hand the mic back. Thank you, Augusta. I think that was very illuminating. Uh, it all uh, sort of comes together in terms uh, of all of us understanding what is the high level cost of, uh, of ignoring climate change and then how to not just look at it as a cost but as a business opportunity uh, to, to grow our business portfolios. Uh, I'd like to move on to uh, Sneha uh, and maybe look at it from the perspective of Westpac uh, in, in the Asia region. Thank you. Thanks, Vikram. Um, let me just introduce myself. 
uh, my name is uh, Sneha, um, and I am responsible for uh, Westpac's uh, financial markets business uh, based in Singapore. My day job involves uh, looking at currency markets and interest rate markets, um, so I'm very much in the business. Um, but the reason why I'm here today is really to talk about how West, uh, to share Westpac's story on sustainability and also to tell you uh, some real life examples of how Westpac has embedded sustainability in our business practices. So maybe I will just start uh, by <clears throat> talking a little bit about um, how Westpac has been thinking about sustainability. Oops, click up. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, so. Um, so to just to pause and, and think a little bit about what do we mean by sustainability? And in the words of our chief sustainability officer, um, it's uh, when we think about banks' role in sustainability, what we think about is what can we do to ensure that our next generation lives better than the last? Now this is, um, a, it sounds like a trivial statement and it's something that we would have taken for granted 10 years ago. But what we are facing in terms of the climate change and what we're facing today, if you read the news all around us, it's very clear it's not something that we can take for granted. So that's a really important part and aspect of, of what we thought about when we think about sustainability. Um, the other thing is, um, um, as I think in the previous panel we put it really well, is uh, um, you know, we, we think about environment concerns, we think about social concerns, we think about governance. Um, in, the, in, in Australia, I and mean, I think Mr. Emmanuel in the previous panel referred to this, we are very much um, um, leaders in understanding our environmental risk and also our social risks. But on the area of governance, recent two, past two years in the Royal Commission have exposed us in terms of some of the changes we need to make in terms of our culture, uh, the way we think about our governance and then the way we think about our accountability. And there are clearly steps that we need to make in order to um, meet the standards that we have set for ourselves. Now, Westpac was not one of the banks um, that we did, um, um, you know, uh, that Mr. Emmanuel was involved in evaluating. Um, but um, it is interesting that we did a self-assessment and we did find that there were things that we could be doing better. Uh, and we've already started a lot of work on that. In fact, we are one of the banks that has um, the voice of the customer on the board and someone who's responsible for bringing complaints from the clients to the attention of the board. So this is something that we are taking very seriously and maybe in the next few years, I can come and talk to you about um, how we've improved on our governance. Um, but today, I do want to talk a little bit about how Westpac do see ourselves as leaders in sustainability. We can see our credentials. We believe that we have contributed to customer value, employee value, community, supplier value, and we believe that we've added to the um, economic value of the world as well as the environmental value. And um, let's also spend a second to think about how we've done that. So in the previous panel, we talked a lot about how it's important to have a clear policy, a clear strategy with clear goals, uh, which are measurable and deliverable. But the important thing is how we're going to embed it and how we've embedded it in, in the organization, in the rank and file of the organization. We also want to think a little bit about um, how we are going to report it um, and how we measure it. And the last bit is how do we help our customers uh, make the transition? How do we support them in this journey? Um, and also, how do we advocate for global change and for changes in policy when that's not happening quickly enough? Um, so I want to share with you one example that I believe um, really does capture this very well. Um, and this is really about, um, oh, sorry, I want to talk a little bit more about the governance first. Um, so it, at Westpac, we have a sustainability team which is um, embedded in our corporate affairs, which cuts across all the business units. Uh, and these are resp they're responsible for um, setting our policy, our strategy, our framework. They are the ones who will make position statements around sensitive areas, for example, agribusiness or coal mining. And in, in the, some of the, um, the decisions and the frameworks, they will look at some of the you know, global commitments, commitments and partnerships that we have. But within each of the business units, uh, we have embedded sustainability specialists. And their scope covers every investment, every product, every financing, and every lending decision that we make. 
It also includes the supply chain management, how we think about our vendors and our supply chain, and how we think about our operations and our employees. So all of that goes into our sustainability governance. And in terms of um, uh, looking at uh, our lending and um, in investment decisions, what we look at is uh, we have an initial screening guideline um, at the time when um, any transaction is proposed. And this is done for every transaction globally. Um, we have two big measures that we look at. Um, one is the ESG-related cr uh, credit risk, and my colleague from Citibank put it very well. We not only look at the what of what the customers are doing, we look at the how they're doing it, and that really, with that, we form a, a view of the material risks of any transaction or any product that we're looking at. And then the second big um, guideline that we apply is the ESG-related reputation risk attached to any transaction. And we think of this very, 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 um, although this is more about the negative aspects of the, the reputation, we think about it um, through a two by two matrix where we look at the sensitivity of our stakeholders to um, any negative reports that might come out. So how would our investors react to this? How would our regulators respond to that? How will our customers respond to that? But we also think about the materiality of the exposure to the Westpac group. So when we think about those two put together, then we take a view on whether this transaction is something that we want to do or not. And if there are red flags, we flag it up. And it sometimes goes all the way up to the board. And quite often, there would be decisions taken that this is not a transaction that we were going to do. So I think there was a question previously in the, in the, in the, in the Q&A in the previous panel about are there transactions we wouldn't do? Absolutely. There are transactions that we have not done. And this is not just done at the initial stage of a transaction. We do annual reviews. We look at hindsight on decisions that are taken. Every time there's adverse news on an organization or a corporate or a project, we will look at our transactions and we review them for suitability. Um, and a great example of how we've done this very well is our climate change action plan that we launched in 2017. Um, so this was, um, uh, this was the third iteration of the climate change action plan. Uh, we started this in 2008. Uh, and in this, we um, wanted to support uh, climate change solutions. So we pledged to finance 10 billion by 2020 and 25 billion by 2030 in climate change solutions. It's 2019, we've already met our 2020 targets. And majority of that is through our um, financing of um, uh, the uh, renewable energy projects through financing um, low carbon transport and infrastructure um, and um, through green buildings. Um, so Westpac finances about a third of Australia's power generation and about 70% of that is through renewable sources. So we feel that we have actually, um, not only have we done something which is right for the organization, we've also helped our community and we've helped the country uh, to move towards a net zero emissions economy. Um, the other important thing is to support businesses that manage the climate-related risks. And for that, we really focus on the emission-intensive sectors. So we looked at those sectors that contribute maximum amount to the emissions, and that includes, in Australian context, it includes coal mining, it includes power generation, it includes agribusinesses. Um, and what we did was um, to try and assess what guidelines should we have for um, financing these businesses? Should we just put a stop to financing these businesses or should we think about it on a more balanced way? And the approach that we have taken is a balanced one to really support um, um, it, it's, it's to support an organized transition, an orderly transition to the, the net zero emission goal that we are trying to get to. And what this means is that we have to take into account not just the impact on the environment, but also um, the impact on vulnerable households that probably can't afford electricity, which is higher. Um, it involves uh, considering regional communities. Um, it includes the impact that we could have on small and medium businesses that are exposed to trade-related risks. So it's a balanced approach. We also want to help individual customers to understand the climate-related risks that they run. So in our wealth management and investment products, which I know is a big industry in Thailand, um, what we've done is through our platform Panorama that we la launched a few years ago, we focused on the ESG considerations of every investment or every product that the, our clients would buy through the platform, which means that um, 
our, our investors could look at their uh, ESG risks on the entire portfolio and make decisions about what's right and what's wrong for them. And this also, this also means educating households on how to manage their climate-related risks. Of course, this goes with go imp you know, improved disclosure of our own sustainability performance, and we've also made pledges on how we will transition to a zero emissions economy, and we've got some, um, we've got some um, uh, targets that we've set for our own businesses, our own operations. And lastly, we want to advocate for policies uh, globally. So this means that we want to continue to support through our own experience and our own insights. Um, we want to advocate and we want to drive policy outcomes and we want to support um, uh, uh, an effective global response. So I'll stop there and turn it back to Vikram. Um, and of course, there are some great examples that we can share, but perhaps we can pick it up in the discussions. Thank you, Sneha. And uh, I think what was very uh, illuminating for me was the slide where you actually show the entire structure of your governance, right? Right from the board, your own councils and how the councils most interestingly interact with external stakeholders and drive the strategy of the institution. And again, congratulations on the 70% uh, climate uh, lending. Uh, it's quite impressive. And I think, um, of course, you know, nuanced for emerging market where it may not be easy for institutions in emerging market to actually, emerging Asia to reach the 70% target, but I think it's something to aspire for. Um, uh, my last and not the least, uh, Peter, thank you. I'll take the podium and keep up with the trend, shall I? Um, just as a brief introduction to myself, my name is Peter Chen, uh, and I've been with uh, BNP Paribas for a little over eight years now. As a little bit of background, I was born in Ghana, West Africa. Uh, I think it looks quite obvious, no? Um, and uh, I was educated and grew, and, uh, grew up in the UK. Uh, and in 1990, I moved to Singapore, and then subsequently to Taiwan, Hong Kong, and then back to Singapore. And in between that, I have been a British citizen, which I'm very proud to say I've now Brexited, uh, and I'm now uh, wholly Singaporean. So that's my brief introduction. Now, before I actually get into my slides, um, I actually want to engage with you a little bit more because there is always an issue, I think, and I heard this through some of the questions in the last panel, on doubt, whether this actually applies to you or not. So let me recount the story very quickly. It wasn't that long ago, maybe three, maybe four, maybe five years, where we could have sat collectively in a room like this, and I can guarantee you nobody heard of the word sustainability. We used it in a very different definition. And even the discussions around this path had a tendency to be more around green. We called it green. We labeled everything green, right? And when you talked about sustainable development goals, 17 of them, did anyone, was anyone actually capable of saying what they were? No, right? And today, we kind of know there's 17. We know the Sustainable Development Goals. Everybody knows what SDG stands for today. And what's very interesting is we're now attempting to basically define each and every one. No? So when you have elements like eradicate poverty from the world, that's a tough one to define, isn't it? So we then sit and say, yeah, yeah, well, no, maybe that doesn't apply to me so much. Well, point at that, let's see, does it work? Technology, ah, okay. So, I wanted to just give you that as a little bit of background, all right, to, to keep your brains thinking about this as a topic, because the one key element and the one key statement I wanna make is very, very simple. We all know sustainability has arrived. Does anyone doubt that? Because if you don't doubt that, then we as business people, forget about being banks, but let's talk about banks since we're filled with banks here, right? Whenever the banks have a new way to go or they see a new opportunity in different businesses, what do we do? We invest, no? We hire people. We hire experts. Why is this any different? It's not. 
And if you don't do it, you'll be left out. But we'll always have the naysayers of, yes, but it doesn't apply to me right now because my customers haven't asked me anything about this yet. So then I'm going to ask you to take a look at the consumers. Because when you look at the consumers and what they buy, it's a little different every single day. No? Even when we ask our own kids today, and I'm going to recount a little story for you. So every time my wife drives my son, who is 21, to wherever he's going, the first thing he says is, Mommy, don't switch off that power cut. Because every time you stop, let's save the atmosphere. That's a 21-year-old. I've been in this industry for over 30 years. I never heard that before. I've seen many changes in what we do as a financial industry. And believe me, there are many, many changes. We're not the first to change. We're usually the tail end of that change. But change is coming. Okay? So why did I put this slide up? It's to illustrate, basically, that there are issues or key ESG issues within each of the terms E, S, and G, which, as we heard from the last panel, cannot be separated. They are all together. This is by no means an exhaustive list. Okay? But I think the point I really want to make for, 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 for this audience is very simple. We as a bank, as in BNPP, started this process actually way before any of the main topics came up. There was a recognition. As you know, France is very, very much gung-ho towards climate change. Um, and today, if you look at the regulatory environment, there's Article 173, which basically enforces all banks into ESG to a large degree. ESG is by no means a single formula. Every bank has a different perspective, and every bank will have a different approach. Okay? So it's good to understand what you're facing, and it's good to then define it. Now, I did say one thing before. Whenever banks see something new, we invest into the future, don't we? This is no different. This is looking into the future. Okay? And in so doing, you have to consider key elements. And these key elements would be like the positive impact culture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Everything that everyone's already talked about. But my point here to you is, we have to invest into the future. So what did we as a bank do? We have a CSR department that's based in Paris. We have 130 people in that group. And that group engages not only with management and the board, but also with the working levels. Because you need feedback from everything. So what did they come up with? Here we go. This becomes our overall guiding CSR policy. Okay? Very complicated. Basically, there are four pillars. And then there are 12 commitments that we as a bank made, both at the board level, at the senior management level, but this trickles down to the working level because we have to execute this. Okay? So the message has to go down. Somebody asked about how you bring the two together. Communication matters. The discussion is not just at the board level and then you walk out the room and you expect everybody else to understand it. So we have to follow the simple rule, right? Whenever a message trickles down, by the time it gets to the seventh or eighth person, it's usually changed. <laughs> Hence the issue with Wells Fargo, as we heard this morning, right? So how do you deal with something like that? There has to be an education process when you bring people in, not just at the junior level, at the mid-management level, but at every single level. Okay? And we've made it compulsory, basically, for everybody to basically pass all these different, you can call them tests. Yeah? But take a look at this. I'm not going to talk you through each and every point but I want to illustrate how we implement certain things. So we talked about climate just now. So let me, let me illustrate this point. When you talk about climate, and you'll see in, in the boxes below where I've listed some examples, what we've done as commitments, right? So when you talk about climate, for example, and renewable energy, we've actually invested more than, well, I mean, we've committed, let's say, more than 15.4 billion uh, euros to that in terms of financing. And that target grows every single year. How does it break down to each individual that sits in this room, for example? Assume that we're one company now. 
How do I determine what your carbon emission is individually? It's correlated. Why do I say that? So we fly on business trips, don't we? And we know that the airlines industry has carbon emission, don't we? So if you actually fly by economy versus business, you would say the carbon emission is the same. Yes, it is, but from a sustainability point of view, cost per person, it's actually less. Do you see the detail that you need to get down to if you want to get serious about this? And this is only from a climate point of view and only from a carbon point of view. But we have to start. We can all say, it doesn't matter. But if you say it doesn't matter and the rest of the world moves on, let me cite some examples. Thailand, you're the first example. Commitment at the top. BOT. Look at Korea and the government. Look at all these different countries in Europe. How can we possibly say it's not happening? So one thing I want to highlight is very simple. There are a lot of these kind of policies that you can create, but it's a very, very dynamic process, meaning it will change. You don't set a policy and walk away and say, we're done. You're never done. You constantly have to reset. You constantly have to gauge. So as banks, it's not insular. It's actually very relevant in terms of your client base because at the end of the day, your client base will determine your direction. And if they start to become a lot more sustainable because their consumers are demanding it, you have to change. That's one part of the game only. But you know what's interesting? So I put this slide up as well just to give you a little bit more in commitment because there was one question when I was asked to speak about how do you make sure that within the firm you have this commitment? Well, I can tell you something. From a senior management point of view, forget the accolades at the bottom, but from a senior management point of view in terms of our group CEO, our group CFO, our chairman, they're all involved in various different committees around this as a topic. And in much, much more than just climate. There is gender equality, et cetera, et cetera, as we go along. So sustainability, as you can see, is defined in a much, much broader context. So to this point on uh, client transition, very important, right? Because what did I say at the beginning? I said, one thing that some people will say is, yeah, but it doesn't involve me because my clients don't think it's important right now. They're not changing their industry because I am telling them to do so. Think about the reputational risk. We talked about palm oil earlier. Banks just finance that. And let me tell you, it's only a, maybe 1% to 2% of the total amount financed. But that 1% to 2% can cost you a huge amount from a reputational standpoint, right? So we have to handhold our client base too. We have to teach them the importance of why they need to look at sustainability from a broader context. And depending on the industries they're in, we have to guide them in terms of the elements that are important to them. Climate is definitely one that impacts absolutely everybody. Take the shipping industry and take the chimney stacks and the power that drives ships today, highest pollutant. And what we want to do is to reduce that. So where is the opportunity in that? Innovation and technology to reduce that. Battery life to reduce that, no? I cite battery life could also be hydropower. So there are many different elements and many differences in terms of how we do that. But what is important is to create systems that actually take, you can, where you can actually ask clients to input data into what they do and kind of get their ESG scoring out. We incentivize that by giving them loans where if their ESG scoring starts to get a little bit better, the loan starts to get a little bit cheaper. And hence, you see all these differences in terms of all the various different products that are up there. Does that make sense? People talked about data. I'm going to spend just a little, a few more seconds past my time on, on data. 
Data, to a large degree, you have external data, but external data is by no means complete. A combination of external data and the average of that data maybe helps you a little bit more. What's very important to remember is actually you as banks, let's say, you have your own data too. Your risk group, your credit group. And you need to incorporate basically a lot of what you do from an ESG standpoint into every layer of how you do your operations. It's not as difficult as you think. The investment cost is not in your systems. You have them already. The investment cost is in the people and the time. But it's well worth it. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I uh, really appreciate uh, the last point you made about investing in resources. Uh, because I think uh, from a long-term perspective, the cost of foregoing this investment could be significant. Uh, of course, you know, the IFC, you know, we invest a lot in this because this is what we stand for. This is something that we value a lot. I think uh, somebody mentioned, uh, I think it was Citibank who mentioned they had four specialists sitting in New York. We have uh, 10 specialists sitting in Bangkok. And so that's how much, uh, you know, we value this, uh, this intervention and trying to bring all that expertise to bear, particularly where it's needed most. Uh, I'd like to just move quickly on, on to the, the discussion part of uh, the, pre the presentation today. And uh, I think we spoke a lot about the experience of, uh, you know, your respective institutions. Uh, I'd like to maybe request each one of you to maybe talk briefly about what are the challenges, you know, what are the main issues you faced uh, as a practitioner in terms of uh, the internalization and, and also uh, in, in the context of uh, operating in, uh, in emerging Asia, uh, does this compromise your competitive position in the market? Thank you. Maybe start with uh, Sneha, with you as a business. Um, okay. Um, I think that one of the big challenges is um, that in emerging Asia, it's not. Um, it is not that people don't want to uh, to do the right thing by the environment, but the reality is that the transition from where we are now, be between where we are now and where we want to be, there's a transition phase. And how do we ensure that we cre we we um, um, we take a balanced approach in, um, in, in creating an orderly transition. Uh, and this means uh, you know, evaluating transactions and customers and lending decisions and financing decisions very carefully um, you know, in, in terms of how we think about it. But one thing that we have been um, quite successful with is um, doing things like sustainability linked loans. So it's not just about bonds, but it's about linking um, um, our, um, our loans and our financing to sustainability performance. So in this example, uh, we, uh, we transacted with a customer. We, we had a financing which was linked to sustainability scores, which were prepared by Sustainalytics. So this could be something like an ESG score. It could also be something very specific to a company. For example, how much of their um, energy procurement is through renewable sources and setting clear targets on those. Um, and then uh, linking the loan returns to the performance of the company. So better returns would lead to better performance. Uh, sorry, better performance will lead to better loan terms and vice versa. So we feel that giving incentives to our customers to transition on this journey is one way to do it and to address some of the challenges. But it is an open question and it's a difficult one, but it's really about moving away from just purely looking at things from a financial basis, but to in include ESG in your day-to-day -day operations. And for our rank and file, the most junior relationship manager to be thinking about that front and center. That's an excellent example, uh, Sneha, because SDG linked loans, they're a new uh, innovation, but basically you're creating an incentive for clients to perform on targets that they've been, they've been set out to. Uh, better loan terms uh, directly goes to your bottom line. So I think it's, it's really incumbent on financial institutions, and, and thank you, SPAC, for, for doing that. I've also seen Japanese banks actually provide such kind of financing to Thai corporates here in Thailand, and, and that's, uh, that's, that's the wave uh, of the future. Uh, Augusta, what, what do you think? Well, change management 
um, as, as many of the top leaders in this room are aware, is to some extent an ability to tell the right stories. And when I want to engage my staff, I need to exercise their imagination a little bit. Um, one story, for example, that I just heard this morning was uh, there's, there's a guy that invented a solar plane, uh, Bertrand Piccard, and it can basically fly forever. And when he asked avionics experts and all of that, the way that they framed the question was, how can I turn my existing plane into a solar plane? And so rightly, they said, it's impossible. He went to some other uh, areas of expertise, some shipbuilders, guys in solar, and all of that, and said, and reframed the question. And he said, how could this thing be possible? And so he came up with this plane that's got a lot of surface area. And uh, the, the plane is up in the air. It's flying right now. So the question is, is, is what does ESG, in my case climate, represent in terms of this staff's ability to do his job better or maybe to engage with my company better or to respond to a shareholder question better so that it doesn't become a question of, well, what are we going to do so that in 2030 something will happen, but rather a supervisor how are you making your staff uh, get to those climate-related opportunities today uh, to achieve these bigger goals? Thank you, Peter. I'm oh, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Peter. Okay, so let me address the first thing, which is challenges. Um, we all face probably the same challenge, right, which is revenues. And uh, when you talk about um, a little bit more in terms of what we're trying to get done within the sustainable world, it has no difference in terms of impact on revenues. Your revenues are still low. However, if you were to compare that with certain banks that are much more involved, let's say, within financing, um, in, a, in, a, in a local perspective, they're probably going to find more returns. But then we also know that those margins are being diminished. Okay. So that's one key challenge. The other key challenge being a bank that has over 200,000 people is how to get the same message down to everybody. So I already kind of discussed this commitment piece of the pie, making sure that internally we are properly advertised in terms of what the commitments are. So we as a bank, for example, we've stopped financing oil and gas shale. We've stopped financing tobacco. And these are businesses that basically comprise maybe between 50 to $150 million a year. So it's by no means small. Okay? It's a commitment. It's a future kind of point of view. In addition to that, um, we also know globally that regulations are hugely different. No regulation is the same. Country to country, they're different. And as an international bank, we are subject to not only French law, EU law, British law, but also law for every country we're in, in terms of having a branch. So when you create the policies, therefore, within the broader context, using a CSR group, and our CSR group, as I mentioned earlier, is 130 people in Paris. They have to take into consideration all the various different legal aspects. It's not easy, but we did it. Okay? Because if you looked at all the commitments, the 12 commitments, the four pillars and the 12 commitments that we did, basically at the end of the day, you have to define it by country or by region. When you then look at it from an opportunistic point of view, Sneha had mentioned that you have you know, rewarding loans, for example. It's not just a bond issue. Um, but there are many areas in terms of not just, let's call it sustainability from a broader context in terms of every aspect of what we want to achieve when we align that now with the 17 SDGs. It does create potential opportunities. 
in a world where interest rates are super low and likely to remain low, in a world where we don't see any major recovery, we have to find something a little newer, don't we? Thank you, that's, that's thought-provoking. Uh, one additional point that I'd like to make for the benefit of the audience is there's a lot of strength, and I have re-emphasized this again and again, uh, uh, looking at Singapore, looking at Thailand, Malaysia, the banking sectors are extremely strong, extremely robust, great leadership. Uh, and these banks are now not just local banks. These are regional banks with significant presence in, in what I would say frontier Asia. You know, take Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos, where the implementing environment is, is much weaker, significantly weaker. So it's incumbent on, on uh, institutions, uh, banks operating in sophisticated environments to keep that in their mind when they actually go out and invest in, in these frontier markets because they're not bound necessarily by local laws. They're bound by their own systems and practices. And I think that is an Im important uh, difference in strategy and direction which, which we believe strongly uh, will lead to long-term sustainability of your operations in these countries. Uh, and that sort of links to the second part of uh, my um, questions was, you know, what role uh, can the regulator play in this exercise? Uh, we've been in discussions with the BOT over the last uh, year or so to try to help uh, them move in the direction of developing a sustainability framework. But as, as a participant, what role does the regulator play? What role does do international networks like the, uh, the NGFS, the Sustainable Banking Network play uh, in this regard? And what, what more do you want from them to help you move in the direction, maybe? Sneha, we start with you. Thanks, Vikram. It's a really, really good question. I think there's absolutely no doubt that the finance sector overall has, um, has stepped up their efforts to combat um, climate change ever since 2016 Paris Agreement. I think since then about $250 billion have been allocated to green projects, most of that in green bonds. Uh, if you look at the assets under management with sustainable criteria, $30 trillion have been allocated towards sustainable projects. But the reality is that global emissions are still up. So despite all of that, we're really just scratching the surface of what we need to do. And it's really incumbent on the regulators to play a key role in bringing industry players together. That includes banks, it includes investors, industry groups, and, 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 and every, um, every regulator has, um, should be able to do that and pull the, the, the key players in their industry together in order to make a roadmap of how we will transition to an economy with, which has a bit more of a sustainable future, I would say. Peter? Um, I think there is a degree of involvement that's very important. Um, and let me qualify that statement now. So earlier we talked a little bit about the haze, right? Uh, Governor, you mentioned it as well. Um, and one way to address that by creating, if you like, a degree of publicity for the government, generally speaking, the regulators as well, okay, or part and parcel, is to create projects that are collaborative. So that was another kind of buzzword that we had earlier, right? So what we did was we created this project called the Tropical Landscape Financing, uh, Landscape Financing Facility, which basically involves the uh, Indonesian government, it involved a private equity firm, it involved us as a financier, okay, uh, as well as uh, elements obviously of the regulatory board because they have to be there, um, as well as a, a, a multilateral development bank. And the purpose of that was to create, if you like, a known factor, to build up a known factor, right? We need to have this thing advertised better. The purpose of this financing facility, it's not a loan, it's a financing facility, was basically to teach the farmers a little bit more about how best to cultivate their land, and in particular, actually, the palm oil industry, um, and making sure that they were better aligned with uh, the 17 SDGs. So. It would be nice to see more involvement, actually, I think, from regulators and governments, generally speaking, in projects like this, because 
it raises the bar in terms of how you're viewed. No? Look at Japan and look at what GPF has done. And all the announcements they've made, basically the entire asset management group today have converted what they do in terms of asset management, right? They're becoming a lot more sustainable in approach. So sometimes it's not about the benefits that you create or the incentives that you give, but it's where you show up. Thank you. Yeah, I just okay. wanted to add just one more point. I think it's also important for the regulators to create a level playing field. Um, and that's an important thing, I think, for, um, you know, for, for every country that, that we operate in. Um, in Australia, we have formed the Australian Sustainable Finance Initiative, where investors, industry groups, uh, for big four banks and the other Aussie banks have come together. Uh, and it has observers from APRA, as well as the UN Environmental Programme Finance Initiative. And the idea is to come up with a roadmap to do exactly, exactly that. Thank you. August. Yeah, Mark Carney was answering a question from an activist, a climate activist, a couple of years ago when uh, quantitative easing was still, still an issue. And the activist was asking, the, uh, we are pushing uh, the fi climate-related financial disclosure, yet at the same time, in your QE program, you're investing in a lot of uh, companies that are involved in fossil fuels. How do you explain that? And I thought, of course, his answer is far better than what I can explain. But basically, he described the difference between an entity that's meant to promote financial stability and whose investments could make markets go wonky uh, if uh, they went too far outside of uh, the, the norm, and the uh, relatively lighter enforcement of financial disclosure, which adds to financial stability because investors understand better what they're investing in. And so there's always a fear, I guess, on the private sector side that the regulator will become a climate activist. Uh, and I think that's an open question still. I think most responsible individuals would just say, you know, financial stability is the holy grail. We work towards this. Thank you, Augusta. Uh, I think I would also like to add the point about international networks, and I think uh, the the video message from uh, the chairman Frank of NGFS was pretty illuminating on the opportunities that this network offers to the BOT, of course, which is already a member of the NGFS, to learn from its peers who, who've made the journey. Let's not reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of knowledge out there which can be leveraged and, and used to drive policies here at home. And similar to that, the SBN, uh, which has been working with a lot of countries, and we have about 35 member countries who have adopted sustainability frameworks, which commit the entire financial sector to higher standards of sustainability over a period of time, not immediately, but, and there's a lot of capacity building, there's a lot of um, uh, carrots, and there's a lot of stick along the way that encourages investors, partners in the financial sector to, to move in that direction. So there's a lot of knowledge out there. Let's, let's try and, and partner with these institutions, these networks, to, to shorten the learning curve for us here in Asia. So I'd like to stop there and actually open up the floor for, for Q&A. Thank you. Request the person asking the question to just uh, raise your hand so that the mic may be uh, forwarded and then also introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi, my name is Wienerin. Um I work on sustainability um. issues. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, thanks. Uh, the, I think this forum is very, very interesting. I'd like to ask a lady from Westpac um, to maybe share a bit about the thought process that went through um, specifically related to the controversial Adani Coal project in Australia, the Adani Coal project, because that is something that's very controversial. And um, I think the Australian banking industry took a stand. So I think the thought process as to why that stand would be very, I think is illuminating. 
I'd also like to ask Vikram from IFC perspective too to share your experience um, from how IFC has dealt with issues not just at the beginning of a transaction but through your supervision, specifically, you know, the cases that um, civil society is quite aware of is the Yanacocha Gold uh, Project in Peru. And there are a lot of lessons learned that came from that. And I think that would be sort of quite useful for the audience. Thank you. Thanks for that very difficult question. Uh, let me preface by saying that, again, I'm not an expert or not a sustainability person here. But what I can share with you is that Westpac did spend some time, a lot of time, thinking about how we were going to look at the coal, coal mining sector in particular. Um, and whilst we, um, whilst we want to, um, we are aware that the, um, the transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy is not an easy one. As you remember, we've had uh, a lot of um, weather-related um, issues in Australia that have, have led to soaring energy prices, and that was there was an energy crisis in Australia in 2017. Um, so therefore, we are aware that the, the way we think about um, energy and power in Australia will be a mix of the fossil fuels as well as the renewable energy projects, but we know the direction we want to go in. And so when we thought about the coal mining uh, industry and how we want to support that, we really thought about what is the lowest um, emission intensive um, projects that we could finance in that, in that space. And then we defined we defined it very clearly by saying we want to only support thermal coal with a certain calorific value, and we want to support only those projects that have the most advanced form of power generation, because we know through a lot of work that we did in that industry and in that, um, in that sector is that that is what's going to least, lead to the least amount of emissions. And that also means that not financing new coal mines, and it also means uh, you know, really sticking to those standards that we've laid for ourselves. So, um, yeah, so if, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. And, and uh, on IFC's experiences on dealing with controversial projects, we have a lot of them. Um, of course, the Yanukuka, uh mine in Peru is one, but we have examples of coal projects we financed in the past. We have examples of cement. We have examples of almost agriculture. There's just so many. Uh, and the IFC, of course, gets exposed to... Uh, a lot of attention because any projects that IFC finance, uh, the civil society, the NGO community expects very, very high standards. And, and a lot of the time we are working in very, very low capacity environments where government and in many cases the companies do not have the capacity to meet those standards immediately. And, and hence the question you asked about life cycle management, right? We, when we sign up with a client and we provide a facility, we don't expect compliance. We expect compliance with law, of course, which is true of all banks. Uh, uh, in But we build a roadmap, right? We build a roadmap which we capture in what we call as an ENS, Environmental Social Action Plan, which commits our clients to meeting our performance standards uh, over a period of time. It could take six months, it could take a year, in some cases, maybe even two or three years. And we track performance. We get numbers, we get data on each of these parameters uh, on an annual basis, which we capture in an annual monitoring report. And, and all these, uh, the, the ESAP, uh, the ESMS, which is the Environmental Social Management System, our risk assessment is all put publicly out there before we invest in any project, which is to encourage transparency. And so corporates and sponsors who really care about this, it's not a box ticking exercise for them, want to work with IFC because they know to make a man meaningful and tangible change in the direction, uh, they need the help of an institution like us that can help build an internalized capacity to, to move in that direction. And it's, it's really not easy. Uh, we have independent accountability mechanisms which expose us to a lot of criticism. It's not as if the IFC finances bad projects. We finance difficult projects and we are more open to criticism. But that's the nature of the game for us. And we're happy to play in that sport because we are the frontier of driving this change. I hope that sort of addresses the question. Uh, I have a couple of questions from the audience here, actually. How would stakeholder, stakeholders appreciate a bank doing good on ESG? And I think a linked question is, 
by incorporating sustainability in their lending practices, how do we ensure that we do not price ourselves out of the market by those who are not as open as us? Good questions. Take a stab, but the first one at least. The, I think about a month and a half ago, um, MSCI Global, the index makers, came up with uh, their first climate indexes. And in response to sort of questions about stakeholders, I think, or shareholders, I, I would like to invite people to, to imagine uh, a better world where the money of the world goes to the best actors in ESG and climate. And I think to some extent, the work uh, done by the uh, index um, uh, companies uh, is helping that to happen. Take a stab at the second one. Being a parent, maybe I'll answer it like this. Um, if my child were to get better marks by cheating, because other people cheated, um, versus uh, my child that did well with what he knew without cheating, what would I reward? Certainly the child that didn't cheat. And I think that as we grow our ESG conscience, I'm, I'm, I'm very confident that the world is going to move in this direction. It's just a matter of time. I'll try and stab at both of them, okay? <laughs> On the first thing about uh, shareholder value. So today when uh, companies are valued, is it valued in the same methodologies that we used to value them at or is it more futuristic? In other words, a lot more future looking, no? So people tend to look at the management and tend to look at what the management policies are, what the management strategy is and what the future brings for this particular company. And if the world is talking about this as a topic and you're not, what's going to happen to your share value? Okay, so that's answer number one. The answer to the second part now, um, reality when you talk about pricing, we're in Asia and we all know that pricing in Asia is so tight it's killer. Correct? So when we talk about loans and we talk about um, bond issues, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You tell me one instance where you're not getting killed. We're suffering because margins are narrowing, right? And these are narrowing irrespective of credit ratings. Am I right or am I wrong? So we have to go figure out a new way of handling this, don't we? So when you talk about the competition of the people who don't need to follow this and are cutting themselves down, trust me, they're also killing their own uh, margins. So it's a matter of time. To beat them, you just continue. You have to have your strategy and the way you want to think, right? So somebody said that earlier on, you must have your objectives. Thank you, and as uh, you know, and, and I, I couldn't have put it better, Peter, because we are at the forefront of facing that challenge, right? Every project that we go in, uh, we expect much higher standards of performance from the companies that we're investing in. And in a lot of cases, the regional local banks are not. So the question is, do I take the same cost of financing and just get it done, and I don't have to deal with this list of IFC requirements? Yes. And so, you know, uh, that does hurt us in the short term. But the institution believes, uh, being at the forefront of driving this change, that it's a worthy investment in the, in the longer term. And I guess it's an easier decision for me to make as a development institution, and a much more difficult decision if you're the CEO of a large bank in, in the country and you're driven by uh, other parameters. But I, again, go back to the point that Peter made. It's a short-term perspective versus a long-term view on where business is heading. And this is coming whether you want it or not. The earlier you step up to move in the direction, the better. And the more the regulator can do to help level the playing field, the more easier it is for bank management and boards to commit to moving in that direction. So uh, with that, I think we should probably stop. Uh, I think our time is 12.30. I'd like all of you to thank the panel for a very lively and entertaining discussion and wonderful to have all of you share this afternoon with us. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Mr. Vikram Kumar and our panelists. And thank you, everyone, for your questions. This marks the end of the morning section. And before we go on to lunch, I have two announcements. First, for everyone in this room, please join us for lunch on the second floor, which is this floor, right across the hallway. For our guests who are watching through the live stream in Panya Paisan room, please join us for lunch on the fifth floor. Members of our staff will guide you there. We'll reconvene at 1.30 p.m. Thank you.